and welcome to The Writer's Mindset with me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Betts. Each week, we're here to bring you the strategies and advice you need to achieve your writing goals. This week, we're talking about how to world build when you hate world building. Christina Adams is an author, poet, and blogger from the UK. She has published 18 books, even though we said 16 in January, but let's not focus on the fact that we can't count. Is a freelance content marketer specializing in health, SaaS, and marketing, and my favorite co-host of the Writer's Mindset podcast. In her spare time, she likes to hang out watching mummy documentaries with her dog, Millie, and inflicting strange cooking experiments on her boyfriend. That last bit makes me sound like a right weirdo with the changes you made. <laughs> <laughs> you are a weirdo. That's why I love you. Yeah, okay. I'll grant you that. <laughs> Her third fantasy book, The Necromancer's Secret, is out on the 29th of March. Today, we're talking about how Christina got back into writing fantasy after a 10-year break because of how much she hated world building or anything that helps make her more organized. I'm not that bad anymore. Oh, <laughs> that, that wasn't planned i swear <laughs> i think if we'd planned that it wouldn't have happened at the same time <laughs> a big thank you to our patrons for all your support we really couldn't do this without you as a patron you'll get early access to episodes bonus content and our undying gratitude for supporting all the hard work that goes into creating these episodes to inspire and motivate you And when we hit 15 patrons, we will be setting up a Discord for you all to connect with each other so you can get that moral support, whatever time zone you're in, wherever in the world you are, whatever you're working on, you have got a bunch of other writers who understand what you're going through and whom you can really rely on to help you find solutions to those problems that you might be facing, whether they are creative, whether they are mindset related or whether they're business related. Sounds amazing. Where can our writers go to find out more? To find out more, visit patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. I I noticed that your t-shirt there, and for anyone watching on YouTube will be able to see now, Christina's t-shirt reads one chapter at a time. Is that an important mantra for you? It is. It's, It's how I generally take any sort of writing or editing process that I do. Um, like when I was working on uh, the fifth Afterlife course book earlier, I decided I would just write one chapter a day. And if I did that, that was a win. And I think having these smaller goals is really important because then you get to tick something off your to-do list and feel productive without going in a mad panic about the fact that you've got to write 50,000 words, 100,000 words on a book, which is quite a lot and kind of a mindfuck sometimes. It's a lot of words. It's a lot of words. Taking it one small milli step or chapter at a time <laughs> is the way we like to do it around here. I've gone for a slightly more passive aggressive t-shirt <laughs> uh, that reads, I'd rather be writing. Uh, I like to wear this out in public when I have to do things just so everyone knows where I'd rather be. It's a good way to tell people what your favourite... No, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> My brain derped at a response. Suggestions welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, where can we find the merch, Ellie? Our merch you can find at writerscookbook.com forward slash merch. So then, Christina, a very on-topic question of the week this week. I would like to ask you, what is your favourite fictional world? Initially, when you asked me this, my brain kind of derped and then immediately came up with a really good answer. No, it came up with two. So I have two, and they're both... um, Kind of different, actually. One is the Vampire Academy world by Rochelle Mead. I love that series. I reread that series. It's one of my comfort reads. I think what she's done in terms of bringing that world to life so vividly without sacrificing on pace or characterization is really powerful. And the other world that I keep returning to is The World of the Gateway by E.E. Holmes. And I always get tongue-tied saying that. I don't know why. My brain doesn't like saying it. But that's um, an eight-book fantasy series. I think she's doing another one in it now as well. And that is about ghosts. And that series is kind of one of the things that got me interested in stuff about ghosts as well. So I'm sure we'll cover that in a bit more detail in a bit. But that series offered me a lot of comfort during a really challenging time in my life. And so did Vampire Academy during a different time, actually. So I think that's probably part of why I keep revisiting them and 
really appreciate them. But I also think during really challenging times in life, those super immersive worlds can be really, really powerful in helping you escape for a little while. Because you know it's not real, but at the same time, it's so vivid that it is immersive. That's so true. I love the escapism of fantasy. That's what you want when you pick up a fantasy book, right? At least an element of what you're looking for. That's part of it, I think. Um, But I am going to pick two the same as you did. So the first one is um, I've been reading through the Dresden Files and I'm really enjoying the world there. It's urban fantasy, so it's still set in the real world, but there's a lot of extra world building that goes into it. And I think the author has done a very good job of the world building in there. The second series I want to mention is the World of Lunaria series by L.L. McRae. It's epic fantasy, but... The way McCrae builds her characters um, and the way they interact with the world makes it feel so much more relatable in one respect, but so much more deep or so much deeper, you know what I mean, and expansive. And the world feels realistic, even though obviously it's fantasy. And I think that kind of balance is a real skill to have. Oh, definitely. It's a really hard thing to do. And I think it's even harder if you're writing epic fantasy. It is. She does a fantastic job. So then, Afterlife Calls is your first fantasy series focusing on the close mother-daughter relationship between Neve and Edie and one or two supernatural experiences. But I know that you didn't actually want to write fantasy for a long time. What made you actually hate writing fantasy? So I... I kind of started out writing fantasy actually I started well no I started with crime and then moved on to fantasy romance and um I really enjoyed it for a long time like I say it was my escapism and then I got to my 20s and was working on a fantasy series alongside doing my BA in creative writing and I had quite a high concept idea for my character I had a very good premise and I kind of knew vaguely some things that were happening but I got really stuck on some of the elements and didn't know how to get out of them because generally speaking when you study creative writing at an academic level the focus is on literary fiction and if you say that you're writing fantasy it's a little bit fantasy or romance they tend to back away slowly from you unless it's like magical realism which is acceptable They back away and honestly, sometimes look down their nose a bit. I'm not going to lie. They do. Yeah. And so I didn't really know anyone who could help me with certain elements of the world building or of the planning or anything. And I just knew that it was going to be three books. And I tended to have something similar to what I do now, which is that I have to know the beginning and the end of each book. And then the kind of end point of that arc, not necessarily that series, but that arc, like the first after I've caused arc is four books but then there's some more stuff beyond that and I knew that but I was morally averse to planning or plotting or any sort of organization for my books whatsoever beyond knowing what my characters names were and that makes world building really fucking hard and I also didn't have a guide I didn't have anyone to go hey check out this fantasy book check out this graphic book because no one really talked about that stuff and we were being encouraged to write literary fiction so my brain just kind of panicked and felt overloaded by how much work was required to world build and to fix the issues with that particular series. And so I gave up because I'll be honest, um, Afterlife Calls is the third fantasy series I have worked on with a possibility of publishing it. But it is the first one I have published. And I had some other ideas before that. Um, The first book I ever finished actually was Fantasy Romance. But Afterlife Calls was the first one I knew would be good enough to publish. And that's not me doing too harsh on myself. Like I talk about empath sometimes and I have a solid vision for empath, but I know the story isn't ready or strong enough to share with people yet. And I don't want to share with people something that is half ass or where I know I can do better. Because if I know I can do better, why shouldn't I? Absolutely. I find it interesting that you had multiple ideas for different fantasy stories, but were just put off by the creative writing degree environment, which is something so many people look for, so many people try and get into. And that was what almost held you back in a way. I wouldn't say that was what held me back, but I was so focused on doing stuff for my BA. And I'll be honest, I didn't read a lot during my BA, which is another reason I shot myself in the foot. I just felt too overwhelmed by everything else I had to do. And I'm a big fan of keeping things as simple as possible. And fantasy is one of the hardest genres to write. So if I've got a choice between fantasy and romance or women's fiction, I'm going to pick the thing that requires less work. 
That's fair enough. I don't, I can't really blame you. What would you say then is the biggest barrier that stood between you and actually writing this fantasy series and publishing the fantasy series? I think for me, the biggest barrier was not knowing what the fuck I was doing, but also not wanting to tell the story badly enough. The series that I originally worked on that was fantasy romance slash crime, fantasy crime with an element of romance, we'll say. Um, I liked it. I was attached to the characters. I wasn't attached to the premise or the idea. And I didn't really have anyone who could beta read for me and offer really good feedback. Um, I did have some people read the idea. They did really love the characters. But the trouble is they were kind of not critical enough to push the book to be as good as it could be. And I think that did hold it back to a degree. But also the concept was too high for me at the stage of my writing career that I was at. It was just too complicated. And I think that's probably what's held Empath back as well. There is so much going on in that book because it's every character has different powers and therefore different consequences to their powers. And there is the main character in her chronic health issues. There is the fact that the love interest is a police officer, that another character is a nurse, that it talks about sexism and racism and homophobia. And it's quite political and it's also magical and it's a mind fuck, right? That's a lot to juggle in a book, even after as long as I've been doing this, which isn't actually that long in the grand scheme of things. And so when I came up with the idea for Afterlife Calls, it, it's really cliche, but it was in a dream. And I didn't want to wake up from this dream because I love the characters so much, but I just woke up and thought, I have to tell this story. How did the characters get to this point? Because I dreamt the climax of the book. I didn't dream the beginning or anything. I dreamt the climax. And I think knowing that climax and the journey the characters would need to go on to get there was really powerful and really motivating for me because I dreamt the end of book one and the start of book two, which is kind of a weird thing to cook up at the very beginning. But it motivated me and already allowed me to see it as a series. So in my head, I've been thinking about these four books as one book for a long time. And I forget sometimes that people have only read one or two books and that book three isn't out yet. Because I'm like already on book seven mentally trying to work out what can happen. I started drafting book five a couple of days ago, you know. Actually, no, I drafted the first two scenes from book five like six months ago. Um, And I did chapter three this morning. So, yeah, I've been thinking quite far ahead on these books, which is very unusual for me. So you you dreamt up the idea then. You felt motivated to write it. How big of a blockade was the idea of finally having to world build? It felt quite big, but because I'd already dreamt up some of what they could do, it made it a little bit easier. Because actually in the first book, the characters' powers are quite grounded and they don't know what they can do. And I kind of thought I could get away with not knowing either. And then no. you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you and Alexa Whitewolf and one of my other friends who beta reads all my books went through it. And you and Alexa in particular kept going, how does this work? What does this look like? What does this mean for later books? And I was like really annoyed and scared and panicky. And I nearly stopped, didn't I? I nearly gave up. You did. We, we had many conversations, well, not many. We had at least a handful of conversations where I think you felt you couldn't do it. And I knew you could. I knew you were capable, but it, it came across like it was a lot to take on and you felt a bit well, overflowed or not, overwhelmed. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, I think I was intimidated by it. But something that really helped me was that you said, because I remember we had a call at one point about it, and you specifically pointed out the fact I got the characters down and I got a lot of the plot down. It was the world building that I really needed to draw out. And that made me think, okay, well, there's only really one element out of all of these other things. So maybe it's not so bad. And then Alexa asked me some really hard questions about the mechanics of stuff and the backstory and things. And didn't like it very much when she asked those questions. But I understand why she did. And they've really helped make my life easier now because I can go, I I don't kind of need to think about any of it now because I already know the answer to a lot of the questions about how things work what things do and occasionally those things grow like based on stuff that you and Alexa have highlighted like as Edie's powers grow she can feel and see a lot more like in the later books she can't just sense people's life essences like for example the Egyptian mummy for deals feels different because he's four thousand years old and um 
eventually she starts to be able to see what people's life essences look like as well. And so they are different colors depending on people's personalities. And they feel different when she absorbs them because of those personalities. Like someone who's very evil, it's going to be black, for example, or someone who's got a lot of energy or is a little bit angry, it might be red or someone who's a bit nicer, it might be blue. I did toy with different shades of blue, but I kind of like the idea of it being different colors of the rainbow, more like auras. Yeah, that makes sense. That's more interesting, I think, for the reader as well, perhaps. Yeah, I, I haven't, she hasn't done it that much yet um, and been powerful enough to see it every time. So it's something that I can think on depending on whether or not she needs it. But it's one of those things like I knew elements of it and it's evolved over time. But I had to know the groundwork to be able to finish the book and not shoot myself in the foot later on in the series because there are things I had to change in book two because of book three and in book three because of book four and in book four because of book five. So it does happen. And actually... Yeah, I had changed quite a bit of book four because of book one. That's interesting. So it goes to show on a slightly related note how important our outlining skills are now, right? That we're, yeah. we've eaten our words, and by we I mean you, uh, <laughs> and now outline and know how valuable it is. It's, yeah, it's funny. You think to a year ago and how like the thoughts of outlining made my brain just want to switch off. And it was working on Hollywood Heartbreak and the overlap between that and what happens in books and also working on the Afterlife Cause series and the fact that it's kind of one story told over four books um, that really made me think, if I've got this outlined, I'm not going to get as stressed out when I'm editing it. Editing isn't going to take as long. It's not going to be as complicated to weave different things in. And I can kind of nitpick the outline rather than nitpick the book. And that is a lot faster and it makes life a lot easier. And I think that's something that Matty Darrymple in particular highlighted in our interview with her, because she said that when she sent her outline to her editor, she realized that the bad guy wasn't who she thought it was. It was someone else. And she wouldn't have noticed that had she not done that outline. And it would have taken her a lot more work to fix it without that outline as well. Absolutely. At this point in time, then, obviously, we already have two <laughs> Afterlife Calls books released. Book three is being released at the end of this month. How do you feel now? Now you've done some world building and you're back into writing fantasy. How do you feel about the concept of writing more books in that genre going forwards? I mean, for the Afterlife Calls books, it's kind of like a warm hug or an escape from the real world for a little bit now. It doesn't That's what it's like me. reading them too, to be fair. Oh. Thank you. That's kind of what I've been going for, that kind of same feeling that I get reading Vampire Academy or The World of the Gateway. There's a lot of drama, there's a lot of shit that goes down for the characters, but it's still really comforting. And that's what I aim to create because I think there just aren't as many series out there for me personally that I've found that are like the kind of 90s fantasy, which was a balance almost of women's fiction and of fantasy. And yes, paranormal women's fiction is much more on the rise now than it was, but it's still quite a niche genre. It is a niche genre. And I think it's it's a good one to exploit. I think you have um, the perfect skills to do so. The balance of fantasy and world building with the human relationships is kind of, it's become, well, it's, it's one of the things I really like about the books anyway, because they complement each other. Is that something that you did intentionally? Would you, did you always want to focus on both? Or were you just writing fantasy and the relationships happened kind of thing? I was writing the relationships and the fantasy happened. <laughs> I thought it might be that way around, actually. But it's still, it's, it's interesting to see that that's what happened. The relationships come easily for me and I tend to know where I want characters to end up in terms of the different relationships, romantic, family, um, friendship, that sort of thing. I usually have that mapped out where I want to go and who I want to break up and who I want to get together and things like that. And so, yeah, that bit comes easier. I get. I guess you do have to see them as related, though. You can't see them as either or because if you separate them too much, then they're no longer related in the series. Like to use Vampire Academy as an example, you know, the fact that Rose and Dimitri are both vampires is vital to the plot. And the fact that they they are in, um, it's forbidden romance. So they can't get together even though they want to be together. And that in particular plays a big role in the later books in the series. So if she treated them as an either or, she wouldn't have that conflict for the later books. And certainly for some of the stuff I'm building up to in later books, if I had treated it as either or, then there wouldn't be as much conflict in the story. And I like the story and the conflict to be a balance of what is relatable and real, like, you know, breaking up when you're 17 and that first heartbreak from your first love and things to the not so real, like ghost hunting. 
Well, I suppose some people do go to it, but not like in the way that Neve and Edie and Ben do, you know? Absolutely. And having those, the plot focus on the character and the character issues, and then the fantasy stuff impacting that, I think it, it's a really interesting way to weave it together. Thank you. It, cover your ears if you don't want spoilers um, for the Afterlife Calls series. But something that uh, you already know. What no, I know. <laughs> um, something that was really important to me is that the big bad in the first four books does the things that they do. I'm trying to be gender neutral and not give too much right here. But they do the things that they do because they are terminally ill. So they are seeking magical power to fix the real world problems. And I think that actually makes that person's motivations a lot more realistic. It does. It's the reason Anakin Skywalker is my favorite character, because he's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, right? Yeah. Or I suppose I don't know if trying to save your pregnant wife from dying in childbirth is the same as that's not in Afterlife Calls, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a spoiler from Star Wars. It's not quite the same as trying to save yourself from dying necessarily. No, that's a bit less selfish. This, less selfish. this character is being selfish. Anakin is trying to be selfless, but actually being selfish because he wants them in his life. Exactly, but you can relate to them just as well. I think you can yeah. go. You can imagine going to those lengths or any lengths to do to try and save yourself, right? Because yeah. that's, that's human nature. So that's going to be relatable. That's what readers are going to be able to relate to. But also, it's a little bit scary that someone will go to those lengths to save themselves and put their own life above the life of someone innocent or a stranger or even someone they know. You've mentioned Empath a few times then, the top secret project that is not ready yet. (laughs) But not so top secret because you keep telling everyone about it. (laughs) Um, What was it that sparked the inspiration for that particular project then? I think this is an interesting story. Empath was the first time I dabbled with fantasy after taking a break when I did my BA. So this was like 2011, 2012 when I stopped writing fantasy, possibly a little bit before. And... I had just had minor surgery. Wasn't that comfortable. Don't want to go into details for anyone who's squeamish. But I couldn't sleep very well and I couldn't eat a lot. And so I told myself the story of empath to make myself feel better. And over the course of like three or four nights, maybe a week even, I told myself the first three books. And it started out as a meet cute between an empath in a bar with... He was actually a superhero at the time. I'd been watching too much Titans and it went to my head. So, yeah, it was about them and their relationship and how it evolved and things. And I kind of thought, hang on a minute, I quite like this idea. I'd like to write it. And I realized that I couldn't really combine fantasy and superhero. It doesn't go that well. And I know the fantasy genre better than I know the superhero genre. So I decided to strip it back and change the male love interest powers and things. And it became fantasy romance. And then it became urban fantasy slash crime. And I wrote a first draft of Empath, I want to say summer 2019. Might have been late, it might have been earlier, but it was definitely 2019 I cooked up the idea. And it was very comforting to work on, but I knew it wasn't quite right. And even before I started writing it, I was telling people about this idea that I'd had and getting them really hyped up about this premise, which is about an empath who has no compassion. Because one of my pet hates in life is when people confuse empathy and compassion and think they're the same thing. I have a lot of empathy, but I have no compassion. So I can relate to my main character quite hard. I, I tend to beat people over the head with the fucking do what you're meant to do stick rather than the here is a nice hug and what you actually want thing. Well, it doesn't sound like you at all. I don't know what you're talking about. I did just say that was me in my defense. I do know <laughs> I do that. And so... I got loads of people hyped up on this idea and they kept saying how good it was and how much they wanted to read it. And then my anxiety kicked in. And I went, oh shit. I think I can live up to these expectations because the expectations were quite high because it's a high premise. High premise, is that the right term? High stakes premise, high something premise. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? (laughs) Anyway, it was a complicated premise and the more I worked on it, the more complicated it got. Also, with one of the characters being a police officer, I don't know a lot about the police. They particularly didn't back then. I've spoken to a few police officers now who've helped me and given me some background and stuff that I can use. Um, But back then, I didn't really know anything. And so it made it quite hard to juggle all of the different things. And also, at the time, I didn't really know a lot about writing fantasy. One of our friends, Sylvia, linked me to a lot of resources about magic systems and how to build them and the importance of consequences for magic users. That really helped. And I kind of stewed on that for a while. And I rewrote Empath and I felt a little bit better about it, but I still didn't feel like it was quite right. And the basics of the premise, they were the same. A lot of the plot changed. 
particularly in the mid middle um, and a little bit at the end, not quite. I still didn't, it still wasn't quite right. And I couldn't work out why. Um, so then I kind of did a bullet pointed plot to really pull things out and figure it all out. And I spent ages trying to figure out all these different things and make sure I got everything. And I rewrote it. And I think the beginning isn't bad. Um, I know the middle is shit. That's not me being harsh. It genuinely is. And then the ending is okay. Um, but I I just knew that beyond those first 10,000 words or so, I'm not comfortable enough to share it with people. And so I put it in the back burner. think, oh, oh you know, leave it there and see. Because I did this the third draft. I don't know if it was before or after I came up with Afterlife Calls. But I came up with Afterlife Calls. And I knew that it would be better as my first fantasy series because the stakes aren't as high at the beginning. And that inherently makes it easier. And it was more women's fiction, which also makes it kind of like a hybrid of my comfort zone and not my comfort zone, if that makes sense. Whereas Empath is now more urban fantasy, which is like another step away from where I started. So required a lot more research and a lot more understanding of fantasy as a writer rather than as a reader. And I didn't quite have that yet. And I think certainly learning what I have from Afterlife Calls has really helped me to improve Empath. I'm not yet ready to start writing it, possibly to start outlining it. But there are a couple of books I want to finish reading first. Like I'm reading the fantasy fiction formula at the moment and just reading one section, going back to basics and looking at characters made me realize I'd forgotten something really basic in Empath. And that was why I was struggling with book one. It happens. That's why we keep reading, right? That's why we keep trying to learn. (laughs) Well, yeah. And that's the thing. Like I had kind of rested on my laurels with Empath and assumed that the characters would fall into place and focused really hard on the world building. The characters didn't fall into place with me doing that. What was it that you forgot, if you're happy to share that with our lovely listeners? (laughs) You're going to laugh at me. We're all friends here. Nobody laughs at each other. (laughs) No, you're allowed to laugh at me. I laugh at me. (laughs) Um, So because the first three books of Empath are what three parts of this one story. They're serial. I was focusing on the bigger picture and getting that right. But she says something in fantasy fiction formula, which is that even if you're writing a series, you should treat that first that book as a standalone. And the character needs a goal for every book. I forgot the main character's goal for book one. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I, I spent loads of time working out the goal for the antagonists and for the male love interest. But the actual protagonist didn't have a goal for book one. She had a series goal because um, and one of the other things that made me realize it, because it was something that was in that book that I happened to read alongside the same time. One of our friends shared a meme in a WhatsApp group about one of my favorite films growing up, which is Anastasia. And in it, for most of the film, she doesn't know she is being hunted. Right. And I had that same issue with empath in that the main character didn't know someone was out to get her. And in Anastasia, it works because there's the other subplot of trying to find her family and stuff. But in Empath, there wasn't that. So there were no stakes for the main character for a lot of that first book and pulling away some of the romance so that it's much more slow burn enemies to lovers meant that there wasn't a lot going on for her other than the fact she's got chronic pain and that having chronic pain isn't a story. It's just a statement. Oh yeah, it's not it's not the goal, is it? <laughs> no, exactly. It doesn't give her a goal either. It's a consequence of some of the elements of her life. And so that made me realize she needed something more and that I needed to rearrange some stuff so that and add some stuff in so that it was clear what her goal is early on. And also without contradicting the fact that she does care very deeply but she thinks the world is full of idiots who just need to do what they want to do and act on their feelings rather than just pandering to society or um, not looking deep enough to how they're really feeling. Interesting. I'm glad you are happy to share that because I think it's important for our listeners to remember that, you know, even 18 books in, we got the right number this time, (laughs) you know, people are still going to make mistakes. That's what we're here for, to learn and to improve, right? Yeah, and I think... I've been asked before how you know when a book is ready. And I do think it is an instinctual thing, but it's also being able to detach yourself from your own writing and being able to see it almost as a critic. And I instinctually know if my readers will like a book or not. I knew when what happens in New York was ready. There are things I would change 
but I'm not going to because the readers like the way it is, you know? And it's not just about my personal choice. It's about what readers want from me as well. Speaking of reading fantasy then, as we did earlier, what kind of elements would you say you've borrowed from other fantasy series, if any? Is that a thing you do? Or do you do maybe adapt different ones or just draw from them, inspire by them? If I do it, it's definitely not conscious. The reason I ask is because when I'm reading stuff, particularly recently, I've gone, oh, that's such a good idea. I want to try and incorporate that concept or incorporate that kind of um, way of doing things. Not not copy and paste, definitely not. I'm not stealing things word for word or magic system for magic system. But if, if there's a certain concept in a book that I like, I might think that's an interesting way of doing it. I want to try and incorporate some of that kind of complexity or that kind of way of working things things like that I just want I just wondered if you did any of that maybe it's just me (laughs) maybe it's just me stealing concepts I don't think it's just you but it's not something I've done for a while um not it's not like a conscious or an unconscious decision but it's um yeah it's not something I've done for a long time I do find sometimes I will read something and go oh I could do this with my character but it's usually like a word or a sentence that sparks something like a shift in my mind rather than oh I can take this element and do this or take that consequence and do that so in the afterlife call series then you have witches you have ghosts you have necromancers what made and mummies if that counts as a magical thing um what made you choose those although i think i know why you chose the mummies and why is it you think they well why is it you chose those i suppose that's the only question i started out with ghosts i always knew it was going to be ghost series and there was a demon in it i didn't know how far i was going to take the demon thing i just knew there had to be a demon in book one and i um toyed with calling the series like ghost calling or ghost calls because the first book is the ghost call and i just thought I want this to be an open series where I can not end it and just keep going if I want to. But if I call it Ghost Calling or Ghost Calls or anything with the word ghost in the title, it's going to be really limiting. And I want to write something with a bit more freedom. Because the problem I've had with the, what happens in Hollywood books is that particularly with what happens in, every book is in a different location. And with Hollywood gossip, it revolves around the world of celebrity. So I just wanted something that gave me more freedom and wasn't as tied to particular things. Whereas if I am just taking the concept of the afterlife and playing with that, that opens up ghosts, demons, mummies, necromancers, vampires, um, some other things I've probably forgotten. There's just a lot more I can play with because the title immediately says this is more of a fantasy horror series than this is just a ghost series. Because it is primarily ghosts, but there's a lot more to the characters than that. There is a lot more going on. And for our listeners who haven't been paying attention, although it's hard to miss it, why did you decide to bring mummies into the series? It was because I knew that in book two, I wanted to put someone in a coma. And mummies just seemed a convenient way to do it. I mean, I d- it works. But I'll be it honest, works I wasn't really interested well. in ancient Egypt before this. I genuinely had no interest in ancient Egypt before I came up with this concept of mummies. 100%. Oh, I I thought no. it was the other way around. I'm so sorry. No. I've, I've, I've led our audience the wrong way. <sighs> um, <laughs> it was like, I knew I wanted to put someone in a coma and I thought, well, what's a supernatural creature that's related to that? And I can kind of put them on top of each other. And somehow I ended up with a mummy. And like, it was just a weird connection in my brain. Genuinely can't explain it. hundred percent. My brain just connected mummies and comas. That's all it was. And then I started binge watching mummy documentaries on a Saturday morning with Millie. And that was where the documentary thing came from. I mean, fair enough. I thought it was the other way around for some reason. I thought you'd got hooked on mummy stuff. And then that sounds weird. I thought you'd... <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought... <laughs> I thought you'd... I thought you developed an interest in the mummies and ancient Egypt first, and then that kind of influenced you. My apologies. No, I I was more interested in Greece and Rome. That that's the I'd never looked into ancient Egypt before writing the mummies first, and then I just got really interested. And even after finishing the mummies curse, I kept looking into ancient Egypt and learning different things and studying it and reading about it. Um, And it's more the actual factual side of things documentaries and stuff rather than the books and the fiction around it because i guess it's just well it's the history it's the same reason i like 
watching stuff on the Victorians rather than reading books about the Victorians is the fact that this is true and a lot of it sounds batshit to us as modern people. But back then it made perfect logical sense to them. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. For one of our listeners then who has to start world building or knows they need more world building or is a little bit intimidated by starting world building, what would be your advice to someone out there who is just getting started then and does perhaps feel a bit intimidated like you did? I think start with what you really need to know. For example, the main thing I needed to know was what ghosts look like for people. And I actually changed it between the original version that you read, Ellie, and then the version that was published. Because in the original version, it depended on how powerful the person was as to how vivid the ghost was. And I had a really cool analogy comparing it to like looking at a standard definition telly to a HD one to an 8K one. And I really like this and it, it still pains me I had to cut it. But for the story... Overall, it made more sense if how visible a ghost is, is to do with how powerful the ghost is rather than how powerful the person is. And that's actually become quite an important thing for later on in the books. So if I hadn't really consciously thought of that, I could have dug myself into quite a significant hole. So I would definitely be mindful of the things you need to know and start with the small stuff and then build yourself up. Because one of the things Alexa pushed me on was the demons and what I would need to know about them because they're not a massive part of it. They're in book one and then they don't reappear for several books. But it's useful to know because I can lay that groundwork for later books and it makes outlining those later books easier because I already know what's coming. And so because I did quite a lot of the world building, particularly on what stuff looks and feels like early on, then it made life a lot easier. And one thing that I should really do that I actually haven't yet is write stuff down. I'm a big advocate for not carrying things in your head. But for some reason, when it comes to my characters, I carry it in my head instead of writing it down. So I do actually need to write down what people's powers are and what they look like rather than carry it. Because once you get things out of your head, you free up that space to do other things and have a bit more creative freedom and you're not blocking yourself off and draining your energy and your memory capacity and stuff. I really should do that after this recording. I think if you are writing a series, you don't have to know exactly the trajectory you're going in, but knowing some of the kind of plot points you want to hit along the way means that you can either foreshadow them or you can make sure you don't do a George R.R. Martin and kill off a really important character. So uh, start with the basics and make sure you uh, write everything down. Or yeah, try and, and plan all... everything out beforehand as well. Yeah, and I think um, do ask yourself those really hard, uncomfortable questions early on because if I hadn't answered some of those really hard, uncomfortable questions like what can Edie do and what are the limitations of her being able to do this and what does it look like, what does it feel like, what does it sound like, all those kind of senses that I forget to include a lot in my writing but that are really important for the world building. If you have those at the start, then later on, it becomes a lot easier to actually just sit down and write because you're not answering those questions as you go. And then you're more consistent as well. Of course. And it's all part of that outlining thing we keep going on and on about, right? I actually think it comes before the outlining. And I think this is part of why my brain didn't like it when I was younger was because I just wanted to sit down and write. I didn't want to do the planning in advance. I did want to pants it. And now I'm doing this as a business, I do have to be more organized and I have fragmented out the planning and the outlining and the writing and the editing. And because I've segmented things up a lot more, I actually enjoy each stage more. When I did writing and editing at the same time, it was too much pressure and I couldn't just chill and be in the moment and kind of treat it much more mindfully, for example. And therefore I wasn't building my writing skills as quickly as I could. And when I was trying to figure out where the story went next as I was writing, it was more pressure on my brain because as well as trying to form sentences, I was basically trying to problem solve at the same time. And they are very different parts of your brain. The same as when you're writing and editing at the same time, you know, problem solving and editing come from the logical part of your brain. Whereas writing primarily comes from the creative part. And if you've already got the problem solving down and you're doing the editing at a later date, you've got much more energy in that first draft to make things sound sexy. And then you get to spend a lot less time editing and you can publish a lot faster because you fixed a lot of the problems in a couple of thousand word outline rather than in a 50,000 word manuscript. Definitely. I have done that on a smaller scale so far. So for first Alex Warrington book which doesn't have a name I've done my first draft and now I'm just going through and reading some books to try and improve it um and then I'll start working on the next stage but I can already see how I can improve my process 
the next time around, right? I think those processes and always looking for ways that you can do it better next time is really important because people think like, I must have my process down this far into my career. And actually it changes with every book because it's about the stuff I learned from working on that book, but it's also how it makes me feel if I enjoy it where my mind is, where my body is. It's a lot of different factors that go into what the process is for a book because the ghost call is the the fastest turnaround I've had for the start of a new series because what happens in New York took eight years and Hollywood gossip took even longer because it was a spinoff of the first one. And then The Mummy's Curse I wrote after finishing The Ghost Call, which was December 2020. And then I published that in September. And by that point, I already had a first draft of The Necromancer's Secret, which is out on the 29th of March. And I had some of The Witcher's Sacrifice already drafted as well. And that's currently in your hands. I know, I've been reading it, no spoilers. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have one final question then for you, my dear. And just for reference to our listeners, I, Christina didn't get to see any of the questions before we started this. And this one is particularly cruel cool and she doesn't see it coming. Uh, I would like to know, which book changed your life? The book that changed my life was Black Fox Thinking by Matthew Syed. And it's because it made me see that you can change your mindset and that there is a different way of looking at the world. Because it's all about having a growth mindset and embracing the fact that it's okay to fail. What matters is how you handle that failure. And if you sit and dwell on it and feel shitty about it, then you're never going to grow as a person. But if you analyze what went wrong and look forward, then you're going to become a much stronger, more resilient person. And since reading that book, I have learned a lot. I have changed a lot as a person. I am more resilient. I have had some very painful, painful lows since reading that book. And I didn't see a way out. But I kept in the back of my mind that nothing is permanent. Everything changes. The good stuff ends, the bad stuff ends. And remembering that was really important to me finding my way out the end of last year when I was really struggling. And that book just really reminded me of how much I still have to learn and how the way I was raised and the way I was taught to think growing up is something that I can change. It's not something that I can stick to. And I've certainly proven that multiple times, particularly like some of the brain training I've done to help with my chronic pain, for example. And yeah, it kind of opened a lot of doors for me. And it also taught me that storytelling can work really well in nonfiction. And the problem was the type of nonfiction I was reading rather than the entire nonfiction genre. Kind of like sometimes it can be the type of fantasy you're reading is not the right fit for you rather than the entire genre. Well, I mean, that book does sound very good. So I'm not too mad that you already had an answer, but I'm still a little bit mad that you already had an answer. (laughs) I will say the same every time because (laughs) I know most people, there are a lot of books that have made a difference to them. And I understand that. But for me, there is not a book that has impacted me more on a emotional and intellectual level. Just, just I, yawn at my sorry. really deep and meaningful answer. Just I can't control needing to yawn. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, that's good. I actually have the book on my shelf, so maybe I will pick it up and actually read it. But, you know, maybe I'll read Gone Girl one day. So I think the thing is, you have to be in the right mindset to read it and heed its lesson. Because I've recommended it to people before who do need to learn about a growth mindset. And they read it and went, yeah, that's nice. They learned fuck all from reading it because they weren't ready to hear it. And if you're not ready to learn about the fact that failure is not fatal, then it's not the right book for you. But if you're ready to build resilience and really fight through the difficult times, the really painful times that feel like they're going to destroy you, then it's a good book for you to read. But I do think that most people who read it will just sit and go, yeah, that's nice and not take anything away from it. Interesting. I'll add it to the show notes and make sure we can check it out if we want to. If you enjoyed The Writer's Mindset, we'd be really grateful if you could leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. Or if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit like and subscribe. It really helps other writers to find us so that we can help them to achieve their writing goals too. And don't forget, if you'd like to get early access to episodes and bonus content, such as what most authors get wrong about email marketing, what I learned from finishing the first draft of my first novel, and benefits of a daily writing routine, come join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash writers mindset, where you've got a lot of big things planned, and we can only do them with your support. Every little bit helps us to help you more, whether it's rating, review, or becoming a patron.
See you next time. Keep writing.